with any agenda to try to talk about COVID. I don't want to talk about it. If anything, we've been ignoring relevant developments in recent weeks as more and more players end up on the COVID-19 reserve list. We talk about the big names, but we don't stop the show to talk about, gee, look, the numbers are going up and a lot of guys are on this COVID-19 reserve list. I mean, we, we talk about when it's significant. And today it's significant because the NFL developed several weeks ago intense next-level COVID-19 protocols for certain teams based upon whether to what extent they were on the fringes of an outbreak. As of yesterday, those protocols, enhanced, intense, apply to every team as of Saturday. Every team. This is an acknowledgement by the NFL, Chris. Yeah. This isn't getting any better. No. It's getting worse. And they're reaching the critical mass of players who have it, of players who have been in close contact with them to the point where they really have to be concerned about shutting things down, not the entire league, yep. but losing games that would go to a week 18 and ultimately not being able to make them up because it just feels like things are kind of teetering right on the edge and they've got to get it under control, especially with Thanksgiving coming. I think a lot of people are concerned about definitely Americans generally defying the recommendation to not have gatherings on Thanksgiving and that that's going to spark a huge wave, a tidal wave of infections into December. And that may be the thing, Chris, that finally knocks the NFL over the edge. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's the the first right move here as far as which like which way the world is moving at this moment. I mean, yeah, it's it's everywhere. Hey, I talk to parents here in you know my hometown with my kids and all that. You know, it, it's it's everybody knows someone right now. Oh, you know, this person got COVID. It's so. Yeah, I mean, we're in danger of it starting to creep into teams or at least teetering on the edge there to where we don't want that to happen. I get this. I think this is the right move to make here right, right at this moment. Yeah, let's get strict right now before Thanksgiving. It's spreading throughout the country, right? Uh, we're not going to do a bubble. And it's also like another warning shot to go to, for, for all the players. Be like, listen, this, you know, we're, we're going to code red here. Yeah, we're going to Code Red because we want to finish the season. We want you guys to get paid. We want to play, do all those things. And also, hey, it's Code Red because of the things that are going on on outside the facility. And hopefully, like, what goes on in the facility will make players who we've talked about, I don't think, are necessarily in fear of it, but just realize, well, oh, okay, I went through this strict day here at football. You know, I got to continue to be strict once I leave football. It's it's on their radar more this way, too. And I think that's a, a positive, at least for the players in that standpoint. And I think the reality is no amount of care away from the facility is going to keep a player from potentially being no. exposed unless he goes straight home and into a room that is sealed off from the rest of the house with no opportunity to interact with any of the other human beings in the building who may have left, who may have been infected, whether at school, all those schools are, are converting back to virtual throughout the country yeah, gradually, it's, it's but happening. not completely, or a spouse who leaves the, the building, the house during the day, or a parent who may live with a player, whatever, whatever it may be, anybody that you reside with, can have it and give it to you when you go home. And as the numbers go up, the chances of that happening go up as well. Here are the basic intensive protocols that apply now that all teams are in them. All meetings must occur virtually. No in-person meetings of any kind at the facility. Masks must be worn by all players and staff during practice. That's one. All players and staff during practice. Yeah. No more than 10 players in the weight room at any time. I'm surprised that isn't the standard protocol, frankly. And no gatherings of players or other team personnel away from the facility. Now, this is the one that I, I look at and I say, Where's the union in this? Not that I'm advocating that the union stand up and say, we'll have gatherings if we damn well please. But I don't know how much of this the NFL can do on its own without the union saying we're okay with it. And for all I know, the union signed off on it. This becomes a stew of clauses and principles and protocols while we're also trying to cover the sport. It's one thing to talk about this stuff in June or July, but we're in the middle of a football season. We're trying to focus on the season while this other thing percolates off to the side. And if they are going to get the union to agree to anything, Chris, the best way to solve all of this is just finally do the home market bubble. Why won't they just put the guys in hotels for the rest of the season? 
there isn't much of a season left. Six weeks from this Sunday, the regular season ends and 18 of the teams are done. And for the 14 that will still play, you should welcome staying in a hotel because that ensures that you'll have your full complement of players for your single elimination playoff games. But I still think that the league and the union are engaged in this clumsy stare down as to who's going to blink first because the league doesn't want to have to make a concession to the NFLPA to get the players to agree to stay in a hotel. And the NFLPA doesn't want to just say, okay, fine, we'll do it. They're waiting for the NFL to offer them something to make it worth their while. And it's a game of chicken that ultimately is going to potentially blow up on everyone if they wait for the sport to implode before they finally say, you know, we probably should have had a home market bubble. It's it's still, Mike, I'm with you. I mean, it still seems the safest, most sure way to do things. But, you know, two things. One, the players and coaches don't want it. You know, I know that there's some coaches and teams that are doing that a little bit on their own, but I think the majority, no, they're they're still looking for that little serenity, sanity, whatever it is, where they want to go home at the end of the day and see their wife, their girlfriend, whatever, their kids, all of that. They're, so some of some of that is just not, you know, you know, players aren't now, willing to Chris, give that up. I know, I know. Now, plenty of time to do that if the sports shuts. I down. know, and I'm just saying. That I'm just giving you a little look into what they're yeah. feeling there. And then I, I think the other thing, too, you know, one, is the NFL really pushing that? You know, are they really? like that's No, right. no. They're not, No, right? because they – no, here's why. Because they know that they can't force the players to do it. Okay. So they don't want, they don't want to make an issue of it. They're being coy. This is the I, subtlety of bargaining. All right. You don't want to make it look like you really want it because then the NFLPA says, yeah, if you really want it, you better offer us something. And and you can ask for anything if you're the NFLPA because this is a major change of work circumstances where you're forcing guys to not live at home. You make them 24-hour-a-day employees. Yeah, you're right. You do. And then something, you know, the, the NFLPA probably will want something back. You know, and again, I, I don't really understand that. And I don't think we should go too far with those type of things. I mean – Hey, yeah, NFL players, you're getting money to play and staying healthy and all those things. So I get that. But I guess what I'm really saying, too, is, you know, the NFL has been so steadfast all along with talk of, you know, no bubble and our protocols are perfect. And if they're followed, there should be no problems. So I just wonder how much conversation has really been done there about that. That's, that's all I was trying to say. I, I really well, have no idea, but I just know they've been almost stubborn to say what they've set in place is perfect, and I just wonder if that's really their thought or just, you know, talk. Be it's talk yeah. because they know they can't get the thing that truly would be perfect without putting themselves in a difficult spot financially or otherwise when dealing with, their union. Yeah. Because here's the great flaw in the NFL's approach. The NFL's approach is simple. Yeah, we know guys are going to get it. They're going to go home and they're going to get it. And we test them every day. And the moment we know that someone has it, that's when we activate the effort to identify anyone who's been in close contact. Those guys are gone for five days now. You know, they, they basically identify the positive. They draw the circle around him, and anyone who was too close to him is gone. We have neutralized the threat. Threat neutralized, as Michael Scott once said. The problem is we're getting to a point where it's not just going to be that one guy who saunters into the building no. and gets his nose swabbed, and you find out the next day that he was positive all along, and we got to take maybe three or four guys out. You're going to have two guys. Three guys, five guys, right? And it becomes exponential, the number of people that go out the door with him under this protocol. That's the problem. As the numbers keep going up and up and up and up, and December is going to be far worse than November, I believe, based upon the trend lines that we've seen throughout the country. That's when this, this procedure is going to collapse upon itself because you're not going to have anyone left look at the Raiders yeah currently. well yeah the Raiders well, one guy test positive Cleveland Farrell test positive and seven guys go with him out the door that's what's going to happen and you're going to multiply it by two by three how many how many multiples of one guy 
and all the other guys who are in close contact with him is it going to take before a team just physically can't play. Now, one of the reasons going to the enhanced protocols, Chris, they don't want one guy to take seven down with him. Yeah. And the mere fact that all these other guys are knocked out for five days because they were in too close of a contact with Cleveland Farrell, it shows you that either teams aren't following the protocols or the protocols aren't good enough because you shouldn't have that many guys. The idea is one guy tests positive, nobody is in sufficiently close contact that they have to be removed from the building for five days. So I think that's what they're trying to get to. So when there are two, three, four, five, seven, ten guys positive, no one goes down with them. I think that may be unrealistic, but that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, I, I, it, it makes sense. I mean, especially to what you're saying here. I mean, you're right. We got a lot of guys that were in contact with people with the Las Vegas Raiders, and now, you know, they're handicapped again for this weekend in a Sunday night football game where I'm sitting here going, are we going ha- to get part two? Raiders gets canceled on Sunday night football, and they're going to move this game at some point? I mean, I'm a little worried about that in general. Mike, do you think that – Maybe the NFL is just waiting till after Thanksgiving, and then maybe they'd make a push then to the to the to the NFL PA at that moment, knowing that players and coaches are not going to do this at this time with Thanksgiving. I just don't even think that's possible, you know. Uh, so I just don't think it's realistic because the players won't do it. But do you think they will try to make a push there into December? Because like what you said, the trends are saying it's going to get serious here soon. I think that this may be just laying the foundation for what comes next and getting the union and the players to understand that the next step is putting everyone in a hotel. Right. And what the NFL wants, and it's, it's, it's sad that it comes to this, but this is the way it works in a collectively bargained relationship, union and management. Union has rights. Management just can't say everybody's staying in a hotel. Now, in Dallas, the coaches and the staff are all staying in a hotel yeah. because they're not unionized. Jerry Jones can say you're doing it. What are they going to say? No, I quit. Right. Right? So you got to do it. It's a job. Got to do it. Got to stay in the hotel. The the union says, nah, nah, nah. And that's what they're trying to avoid. They're trying to avoid the showdown where the union says checkmate. They're trying to get the union to self-checkmate themselves, as we would say. They want the union to come to them and say, hey, we have an idea. Instead of all these enhanced protocols, instead of all this stuff where guys get knocked out for five days and they can't play, we got a bunch of guys who are upset. I can't say pissed off, apparently, because they bleep us in England now when I say pissed off. Sorry, I said it Not me. But you got a bunch. I know, that's weird. Somebody emailed last night. They bleeped me when I said it, but they didn't bleep him. Yeah, I'm just a little better. I don't get it. A little smoother with it. Unfair. (laughs) Unfair. But but I, I, I think that they're hoping the union will be the one to say, hey, you know what? Are are you willing to pay for 32 hotels so our guys can just stay there? And and I think that's one of the reasons why the NFL has been coy about it, Chris. One of the reasons why they're acting like they don't want it. It's no different than the dramas that play out in households throughout the country where you know what you want and you know how you got to bargain for it and you know how you got to plant the seed and yeah. you can't make it look like you want it. If you make it look like you want it, then maybe yeah. you're not going to get it. And and that's I think that's the core of this. And it's a shame for something this serious that it reverts back to this awkward dance of who has to give up what to get what the league wants, which is everyone in a hotel. Yeah, I just – I don't think – I mean, I just don't think that moment's ever going to happen unless the NFL just came to the NFLPA to make some extravagant deal or something like that. It's not going to happen until, again, it goes back to our old thing here, until people start losing paychecks. That That's really all there is to it. And if you're – and if – I mean, right now, players aren't scared. They're going, oh, yeah, we've had a few outbreaks with our team here and there and blah, 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 and coaches are the same thing, but we're playing. So it's not like the fear of death or like, you know, the fear of not being paid or the season being ruined is not really there. They keep just going, hey, we're, it's pain in the butt this year. What we're doing, we're making it happen this year. What we're doing, we're making it happen, though, and we're getting paid. You know, So th- that to me is where I don't know if the players – really will ever care oh hey i got covid i can't play the next two weeks doesn't matter i'm gonna make the concession i I just that's where i don't know if that ever happens until it really hits home until it really hits home to where like you're saying it's either starts to be family members are getting sick 
or people in the organization are getting so sick that we can't play and you're not getting paid. And just unfortunately, it, it seems like it'll have to get dire before that kind of move is made. Not getting paid is the key, and it's yeah. amazing that so many people still continue to insist it's not a real problem. How can there not be hundreds of thousands of people whose lives have been touched by this by now? Now, I don't personally know anyone who's gotten extremely sick or, or died from it, at least not within you know the immediate bubble. There have been people in the community that, you know, there's a guy that I've known for years that was on a heart-lung machine for multiple days. That's one of the treatments that they're using for the worst of the cases, but we just need to get people to understand this is a real thing and they need to take steps to prevent themselves from getting it. And I think the lost paychecks will be the most immediate way to get the message across to a broad swath of players if games are lost. And that agreement's already been made. If games are canceled or suspended, the players don't get paid. Forfeits, open question. That's why we haven't heard much talk about forfeits right. in recent weeks, right. frankly, because there's an open question. And the league, of course, will say, oh, they don't get paid for that. Okay, fine. Go look at the agreement. Where does it say? They don't get paid for forfeits. Where does it say in the rules that a forfeited game is anything other than a completed game with a final score of two to nothing? Checkmate there. That's part of this dance. But I think you're right, Chris. It needs to get to the point where the players say, holy crap. And I, I talked to a coach before the season who was consulting with an epidemiologist because – all due respect, the NFL's program here is being run by a brain guy, not a Dr. Fauci type, right. which has issues, frankly. I would not want, if I was still practicing law, to handle a case that fell into yeah. an area that I'd never handled before. Right. That would take a lot of work, and I would always feel like I was a step behind. And boy, if I had only been doing this for the last 30 years, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about doing it now. But an epidemiologist predicted that there'll be, given the sheer number of players, coaches, staff, there'll be a couple of deaths minimum at some point. And we saw the report yesterday that Ed Donatel, the Broncos defensive coordinator, man, won't be back. Is still not back. No. Don't know when he'll be back, but he's still not back with the team after fighting COVID-19. And I've heard other names. And see, this is where I think the retreat to HIPAA is bullcrap. This is not leprosy. This is not some stigmatizing disease. The only thing stigmatizing about it is you were dumb enough to get it. But now at this point where it's everywhere, I think that goes out the window too. And I think it's important for everyone. You're talking about being involved in a business that is an inherent public trust in all the communities where the teams are located. I think they should not hide behind HIPAA or any privacy interest when it comes to this. And it's so bizarre. It's weird. Every day, it's surreal. Oh, you get the report. Well, so-and-so, oh, well, this team, Broncos have a guy who's tested positive. Well, who is it? Well, we can't tell you. And then at 4 o'clock Eastern, they put the guy on the COVID-19 reserve list. Yeah, That's how they tell us. Right. I mean, it's just dumb. Right. It's dumb. And, uh, you know, I poked around and heard a name last night, a fairly prominent name for people who pay extremely close attention to the sport. Poked around, sorry, I can't tell you anything. Well, it's... We need to know yeah. how bad this is. We need to know if there are staff members and coaches who are fighting for their lives. Wouldn't that be helpful to get other people to take this more seriously? Yeah, I think that's the big thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it'd be good for people in the spotlight to continue to just shed light when they do get it, know people, to just let people know that this is real. This is not, you know, some political talking point or anything like that. I and mean, there's still some out there that don't really buy into the whole some, thing. Some, some. Yeah, I know. It's a lot. It's it's insane. 30%. Some. I don't get it. And, you know, you know, again, I've known people who've gotten COVID, like, you know, to you. Nothing serious. I've had a few, though, where, hey, I know a person and the mother died. You know, know a person and the, the aunt died. Right? I've had. So it, it's, it's real. I don't know what else to say. And Ed Donatel, I mean, just that he's the perfect example that it's real. Ed Donatel, I know him. I, he was with him in the Denver Broncos. There's not a better soldier in football as far as an assistant coach, somebody who loves his job. I mean, for you, he he must be miserable for him not to be there. You, you, he is not the kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that's like, hey, I lost my right leg yesterday, but don't worry, I'll be at work tomorrow. Like he he's going he's going. So for him not to be able to, to, to be there, you know, for a human being like him, and I know how his brain works and everything, uh, it must be really a struggle because he's just not the type of guy that would take any time off or do anything like that. 
And, uh, you know, that if that I bet you that opens up some eyes in that Denver organization to go, whoa, if he's not here and it's like that, you know, that, that'll make me be a, a little bit more careful. And there's still an issue that has never been properly addressed by the NFL. And I remember asking about it when we were trying to figure out which players were going to exercise their rights to opt out. The NFL had no opt-out procedure league-wide for coaches or other staff members. Yeah. And you think about it. If anybody's in a position where they should be considering an opt-out, it's some of the older people, people who have lived long enough to develop the comorbidities that make you more susceptible to a bad outcome to COVID-19. Some teams, it never came up. Other teams, you know, you had to ask and you get the well, – It became on yeah. on the coaches I, and the owners themselves right. to just go like, you sure you want to do this? Team by team. Reach out. Right. Right. Team, right. Team by team and plenty of teams, as I understand it, never even mentioned it. It's just like, here we are, we work, and that's what we do. And there aren't going to be opt-outs. Basically, it was never announced. It was never hung on the refrigerator, no opt-outs. It's just – the occasion to opt out never was there. The opportunity to opt out never was there. And I had a coach tell me back before the season, this is the time where it's imperative for the coaches to have a union. And they, they don't, they never have, and they probably never will. Although maybe in the aftermath of this, you'll finally see a push by coaches to unionize. The concern is that there will be retaliation for management and sure. that you will lose your job and they'll find somebody else to come in and be the coach. It's a lot easier, especially if there'd be a work stoppage. All right, all the coaches are fired. Let's go find other guys. There's plenty of guys out there who would want to come coach football and plenty of guys out there who have the skills and abilities to do it, not at the same level, but close enough. Remember, they did it with the officials. Oh, all oh, the replacements will be just as good. Remember that until the yeah. fail Mary? Yeah. Oh, the commissioner would say that with a straight face. All oh, the replacements will be just as good. So that that's one of the reasons why – Ed Donatel had to keep showing up for work every day. Didn't have an opportunity to opt out with some sort of a stipend that would carry him through the season if he chose to do it. It was all left to the teams, and uh, it's created this situation where maybe some of these guys have gotten sick, and we just don't know because they won't say so. And I'm surprised, frankly, that it came to light that Ed Donatel has been away for so I long. I think that's gone on a lot, Mike. I do think there's been a lot of a lot more people within the league who have come down with the virus, and hey, just – We'll see you next week. We'll see you in two weeks, whatever. And nobody in the public finds out. I, I think it's been a more common story than we would realize. It's one of the problems of the media not being in the locker room. Yep. And it's one of the problems of this shroud of secrecy that the teams and the league are putting up uh, for PR purposes, frankly. They don't want they don't want us talking about all these people who are having more than mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. They don't want it because yeah. – uh, you know, the, the, it's just a bad look that they're pushing forward and putting people's health and lives in danger. Although the irony here, and I think I'm using it correctly, I never know. The irony is that's the kind of thing that if they properly paid attention to it and shined a light on it, it could get the players to take it all more seriously. But maybe they realize the players aren't going to take it seriously until it actually touches them in some way. And it's not going to touch them until it takes away their paychecks. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.